Welcome to the second of our two webinars about calculating employee turnover rates. My name is John Lipinski, and I will once again be your host for this webinar. Today, we'll be diving into two practical examples with monthly and quarterly turnover and show you step-by-step -step how to calculate these two measures yourself. As a reminder, for these examples, I will be using an open source program called R. If you're already familiar with R, that's great, but if you're not, don't worry about it. Everything we cover can be easily done with other tools you already know, tools like Excel, Tableau, or Power BI. In today's session, just focus on understanding the logic of the individual steps we take to get our data in order for calculating turnover. If you understand the logic, then you can just apply that logic to your own data using whatever tools you're already comfortable with. From our first webinar, you remember the basic idea of the turnover measure. It's just the number of people leaving voluntarily in a period divided by the average number of employees in that same period. Now let's work through a detailed example to see how this really is done in practice. We'll start by taking a look at some sample data. You can download this sample data if you want to try these exercises at home, which I strongly recommend. You can only really learn HR analytics by doing HR analytics. First, we'll take a look at our data. I mean, actually look at the data. We'll start with the view function in R to take a look at the data frame, which is just like a table in Excel. You can see that we have four columns of data, the ID, the hire date, whether the person has departed the organization or not, and then the departure date. Note that the departure date is empty for most people because most people haven't left. The departure date value only gets filled in once someone has left. Your HR information system should have something similar. It's important to always take a quick peek to see what your data look like. Sometimes you can quickly spot problems in the data or the format just by looking at it. This is especially true if you need to do a lot of data manipulations to get your data into shape for analysis. Taking a quick look here, we can see that the data makes sense. Namely, that we only have departure dates for those who have a true value for depart. In addition, we can also see that the departure date is always after the date of hire. For good measure, we'll also check that with a quick logical test comparing the date of hire and the departure date. If our data is correct, then the departure date should be greater than or equal to the hire date. I included equal here because in principle someone could quit on the first day. It's rare, but it does happen. When we run our table function to make sure that the dates are as we expect, we see that everything checks out, so now we can move on. To calculate turnover, we need to first select a time period. Here, we will select April 2019 as our period of interest. That is, we want to calculate turnover for the entire month of April. The first thing we need to do is figure out who is working for us in April. We have data from a wide date range, not just April 2019. This means we now need to do some filtering. First, we need to drop all the data for people hired from May 1, 2019 onward. We don't want people hired after our period of interest to be included in our headcount or in the turnover metrics. Second, we also want to filter out all the people who left before April 1, 2019. They quit the company earlier, so again, we want to make sure that they are not counted in our departure numbers or in our headcount. The code that you see here does these two things. First, requiring that every person we consider was hired before May 1, 2019. And then second, making sure that if they have a departure date, it's after the 31st of March. Again, the goal here is just to get the population of people that are working for us in April 2019. Let's see how many people we have that were working for us at some point in April just to get oriented. We can just count the rows here. 893 people. This is the same kind of sanity check you might do in Excel where you look at the number of rows in a file or you highlight a certain column and get a count. It's time to get our headcount for the month. The step is simple. To get the average number of the people of employees during a period, count the number of people employed at the beginning of the period, and add that to the number of people at the end of the period. Then, divide by 2. It's just the average of the number of employees at the start of the month and the number of employees at the end. That's it the exact same steps we talked about in the first webinar. To figure out how many people we had at the start of the month, we start with our April population, which we already know, 893, and then subtract the number of people in this group that were hired during the month of April 2019. I have some code here that just counts the number of times we have someone with a higher date month of April and a higher date year of 2019. We'll assign this to a variable called hired April. 
Again, don't worry about the exact code if you're not an R person. Just follow the logic. So we know we had 893 people working for us at some point in April. Of these 893, we can see from the results that 19 of them were hired in that month. If we subtract 19 from 893, we get 874, which is the number of people who are with us at the start of the month. We'll assign this to a variable called start for employees at the start of the period. It is important to note that there are typically many ways to calculate the same values. I'm choosing a more explicit path here, which might mean longer code, but that's important for what we're doing right now, namely understanding the process. Next, we need to know how many people we had at the end of the month. Let's see how many people left in April by simply counting the number of people with a 4 in the month in 2019 in the departure date column. We'll do this with a set of logical statements testing the value of the month and year. And we get 8. So, 8 people left our company in April. We'll assign this to a variable here called depart April. Something you might notice here is that we have people with departure dates other than in April. In this case, it makes sense because the data we're using here has departure information for the entire year of 2019, including dates after April. As a sanity check on our processes so far, we can look at those departure dates and make sure that none of them are from earlier in the year because we should have factored those out in our first pass at filtering. You can do a table function here to visually confirm that this is the case. If I was working in Excel, then a pivot table would also do the trick. Subtracting the number of departures in April, 8, from the number of people working at some point in April, 893, gives us the number of employees we have at the end of the month, 885. To get our average headcount for the month of April, we now just average the number of employees at the beginning of the month and the number of employees at the end of the month, 879.5. To get our turnover rate for April, we just divide the number of April departures by that average headcount, giving us 0 .009, which rounds to about 1%. That's pretty low. And just to wrap up this example, remember that we can also convert this monthly turnover value into an annualized value. As we learned in the first webinar, converting to an annualized value lets you compare rates calculated over different time periods. We have a single month of data here, so if we wanted to convert this to an annualized rate, we just multiply this by 12. More formally, this turnover rate of 1%, or 0.9%, represents 1 12th of a year, so we multiply it by the reciprocal of 1 12th, which is 12. The result is an annualized turnover rate of 11.1%. Intuitively, you can see that if we lost 0.9% of our employees every month for an entire year, then we should lose roughly 11% over the whole year, which is exactly what we have here. Incidentally, it's helpful to try to make these estimates in your head while you are calculating the values formally. That will help you spot errors in your code, sharpen your mind, and help you develop intuitions about these and other values. Just asking yourself, is this close to the value I expected, really does wonders for your understanding and the quality of your code. You've seen the steps for the monthly turnover calculation. Now let's apply the same logic to quarterly calculations. In this example, we will focus on Q1 of 2019, which covers January, February, and March. The time period is different, but you should see that the logic is exactly the same. We'll start with the original data, but this time we're gonna keep only those who were hired before April 1st of 2019. We pick April as the cutoff because we don't want to have people hired after the end of the first quarter included in our data. We still want to keep people hired in that quarter though because they will count toward our average headcount in that period. In addition, we're going to drop anyone with a departure date before January 2019. If they quit the company before the start of the first quarter in 2019, we don't want them in the analysis. In this code, you can see that we have our two filters, the first one making sure that we only kept those people hired before April 1st so they were hired before our quarter ended. The second makes sure that the departure date is either after the start of our quarter or simply blank. This is a good time to mention that you should always be clear about how you treat empty cells in your various HR analytics measures and how your tools treat those empty cells. Different tools treat empty cells differently, so make sure you understand the process you're using. With that data now filtered out, we'll put all the data into a new data frame called DFQ, which stands for Data Frame Quarterly. We'll start with counting the people at the start of the quarter on January 1st. 
We'll begin with the number of people that were working at some point in Q1, so we just need to count the rows left in our data after our initial filtering. Then, we count the number of people who were hired in the quarter and subtract that number from the total number of people working at some point in the quarter. This just means we are subtracting the new hires in Q1 to figure out who was there in the beginning of Q1 already. In this code, we are summing up the number of people who had a hire date of January, February, or March and a hire date of 2019. This gives us the number of new hires in the quarter. Then, we just subtract that number, 47, from the number of those working in the quarter. This gives us the number of people working for us at the beginning of the quarter. Next, we need to figure out how many people we had at the end of the quarter. For this, we need to calculate the number of departures and then subtract that from the number of people working for us at some point in the quarter. First, we'll count the number of departures by counting the number of people with a 1, 2, or 3 in the month of departure and 2019 for the year of departure. This gives us 23 departures. Next, we subtract that from our working in the quarter at some point number to get the number of people at the end of the quarter, which ends up being 874. We average this with the number of people at the start to get our quarterly average headcount. The result? An average headcount of 862 for the period. To get our final turnover rate for the quarter, we just take our departures number of 23 and divide it by the average headcount of 862. This gives us a turnover rate of 2.7% for the quarter. As you well know by this point, turnover has always been a huge issue in HR and a major focus of HR analytics. In the first webinar, we talked about the essential formula and what each piece meant. In today's session, we stepped you through the detailed process of filtering your data, how to count the number of people at the beginning and end of the period, and the final step, actually calculating the turnover number for that period. The major takeaway from today's session, pay attention to the details and the order of steps needed to get the right data. It doesn't matter what tool you use. What matters is that you understand the process. Once you do a few of these on your own with your own data, you'll get the hang of it and you'll be able to execute these calculations in no time. Moreover, the subset of skills like data manipulations through filtering and getting the proper counts can be directly applied to other measures as well, such as new hire retention or top performer turnover. The bottom line is that you can effectively build suites of these skills over time by working systematically with your data and putting your knowledge to work every day. On behalf of analyticsandhr.com and hranalytics101.com, thank you so much for joining today's session. We look forward to engaging with you again soon.